the title of my talk, as you can see, is uh, Real-Time 3D Content as a New Media Type, Three Key Challenges and How to Solve Them. So quick introduction about myself. I'm CTO here at EGG, um, the company that is pleased to uh, host this event. And we're the creators of Rapid Compact, in case you didn't hear about us, uh, like a platform for 3D data optimization. My background is originally in tech, so I did my PhD on automating 3D data optimization processes. And uh, I did that while I was at Fraunhofer, a research organization that you may have heard of, like um, having done MP3, for example, before as an like, audio format. Yeah, I'm not saying standard, but it became kind of a standard format. And uh, in that sense, we also um, were kind of predetermined to contribute a lot to 3D standards um, when we were still at Fraunhofer with our group, uh, such as X3D and also GLDF, where we contributed, for example, the PBR material model for version 2.0. That's still yeah, the, the most popular one in use right now. So uh, background basically in 3D um, process automation, uh, graphics, geometry processing, and standards. And uh, at Kronos, I'm also co-chairing the 3D Commerce Asset Creation TSG. So um, as you have seen in the title, like I was talking about uh, 3D as a new media type. So um, maybe let's take a step back and have a look at what that actually means and uh, what it can mean and why this is something to talk about today. Um, so you have seen that there are um, re very recently this year, especially, uh, a lot of talks where it's about the metaverse. We see this uh, metaverse projects or like, um, yeah, like uh, initiatives popping up everywhere. And Facebook uh, has just renamed themselves to Meta, right? And you can see here Mark Zuckerberg playing with avatars of himself. So um, that is certainly something where a lot of people believe that there is uh, this. This will redefine the way we interact in the future. Uh, touching topics such as Web3 also. And um, in the center of the slide, you can see, uh, for example, uh, like a little screenshot from the Adidas uh, Metaverse page, if you visit it. Um, and these things are quite exciting uh, for us from the 3D community because in the Metaverse, 3D is actually a central part of the whole tech stack. Uh, like we'll um, interact with, uh, objects, people, uh, virtual places uh, in a three-dimensional way, in an immersive way. It's all about spatial computing. And even before that, like before um, this metaverse uh, topic be became uh, so like popular within this year, already five years ago, there were projects such as uh, uh, the one you can see here on the bottom left side, uh, which is the Smithsonian 3D platform where they digitized a whole uh, skeleton here of this mammoth and then put it online for everyone to watch uh, within their browser, um, supposing that the browser supports WebGL. So the advent of WebGL has really started um, uh, a lot of exciting uh, things like this one. And then with uh, the advent of technology uh, such as uh, like the AR, um, AR kit libraries uh, that uh, Apple put in place, we could get uh, applications such as IKEA Place or to your home where you can virtually place furniture inside your home to see if it fits. So this is all super exciting and uh, definitely one place where we uh, start to see that 3D assets become part of our everyday life experience, such as um, planning planning a room. Uh, that's some, something that everyone does at some point, uh, no matter if you're a gamer or not, suddenly you're using 3D technology. And um, on the right-hand side, you can also see a pretty cool example from Shopify where you have two baby strollers uh, next to each other. And the question is, which of these is the real one? And if you are interested in learning about it, like watch the video by Daniel Beauchamp from Shopify where he resolves it. Um, the key point here is that it's really hard to tell which one is the real one and which one is actually a fake one that's just like existing uh, in the in the camera picture here because it's an AR model. So the technology is there. We have the possibility already to build 
amazing apps, like impressive experiences. And the question is now just uh, why doesn't it happen everywhere already? Why don't we use uh, 3D technology a lot in our everyday lives? Because the tech is basically there. What's, what's the problem? What's missing? And um, as we have already seen in the previous talks, uh, the, there's still a big problem, which is content creation, right? Like, so getting it uh, done right and having, for example, something like the catalog here on the left, where if you just go to a website and uh, like of a big um, e-commerce company like Target, uh, they have a big online shop or the Wayfair specifically, right? Like uh, being fo uh, focused solely on e-commerce, if you Google for a sofa or shoe, you'll get a lot of entries, but only a small fraction of those may have 3D models, uh, like looking at all the offerings out there. They all have pictures, but they're only a very small fraction of online catalogs actually shows you 3D models like the one used here in the PowerPoint presentation. So why is that? Well, because getting it done right in 3D is hard, uh, <laughs> just as easy as that. It's not a trivial process yet. And so our mission as um, companies working in the 3D ecosystem is basically to get it done right. And we believe that there are three key challenges when scaling up 3D um, pipelines. So the first one being content creation, then the second one content encoding and the third one content optimization. And to add a little more detail here, what I mean by that, I uh, added some definitions here. So content creation is quite straightforward. It's just uh, the art of creating high quality 3D assets. And content encoding, by that, I mean the art of translating 3D assets between different kinds of formats and representations. And this may sound a bit boring, like, well, I have a, picture that I store as a PNG and then I can also store it as JPEG or BMP. So what? Yeah? Same for 3D, I have different formats. Uh, there are tools to convert between them. Problem solved? Well, not quite because formats are just encoding different kinds of representations and converting between different kinds of representations of 3D data is a big challenge. So this involves examples like converting NURBs to polygons, converting shader graphs in V-Ray to baked PVR maps and GLTF and things like that, that we have also heard about before. And finally, content optimization is something that I would see even separate from that being the art of optimizing 3D assets for use on a specific platform or within a specific application. And this can mean that, for example, you have a GLTF that's, I don't know, 50 megabytes large and you wanna have a one megabyte version that looks the same, has all the interior parts removed and can be efficiently rendered on uh, a certain mobile device uh, under, and efficiently loaded under certain network conditions within two seconds. Uh, so optimizing content quite different from just finding the right encoding or translating between encodings. And again, different problem from creating high quality 3D content as base assets, master assets, however you call them in the first place. So starting with the first challenge, content creation, uh, let's just look at this example again. Let's say you have a wide range of products that you want to see in 3D or that you want your clients to see in 3D so that they get a better experience and that you get an increased conversion rate in your online shop and reduced number of returns. How can you get all of these assets in the form of high quality 3D models? There are basically three different paths that lead you there. And one path is still the most typical one, the most common one, uh, which is uh, manual or semi-manual 3D modeling. So what I mean by manual uh, 3D modeling is something like you send someone a picture of the actual product, or maybe you even send them the actual product. If it's not too large of the, not too far away. And then the artist will look at it and model it. Maybe take some measurements um, and um, maybe you'll also have blueprints, uh, but in 2D. And then from scratch, you create a beautiful 3D model. This works especially well for cases that are like difficult to, to create with other methods. And uh, you can see here a good example, which is this wicker chair or wicker yeah, 
chair. Is it a that's the right word. Yeah. So um, th this cozy object where you can place yourself inside and it has a lot of wicker around you. So this wicker could be modeled all with uh, polygons, but this would make the asset, uh, asset geometry specifically like very large. And if you look at the left-hand side here, you have a representation of this asset where all this wicker is basically um, modeled with planes that then have a texture that can be used uh, for alpha testing during rendering. And then you get basically visually the same result, um, but uh, don't use that many polygons and it's much more efficient to store it that way. But this requires an artist to basically set up the asset in the correct way. So that's a good example for manual workflow and semi-manual workflows exist as well where you uh, then, for example, use AI to model assets of a very specific category already to some extent uh, that can then be used as a basis for further manual tweaks. Uh, um, completely different approach uh, is conversion from existing CGI or CAD data, because this already leads back a bit to the um, topic of different encodings. Uh, maybe you have, for example, a CAD data of a whole car and you want to show the car in some kind of uh, video game or virtual world. First thing you're going to do is probably throw away all the interior parts that do not interest you. You don't need every screw of the motor or uh, um, the different interior parts to, to be there for the game. And also the engineers wouldn't want them to be there, maybe. So um, this engineering data is going to be cleaned up and handed over to some kind of studio that will then probably do a lot of manual tweaks um, in order to uh, create a high quality model that can be used for visualization. And then the most um, intriguing approach is uh, like probably is uh, 3D scanning in the sense that it basically allows you to get a digital replica uh, um, of a 3D object in a process that is very similar to taking a photo. And um, as I said, I'm looking forward to the presentation from Ken uh, from BotSpot, uh, who is going to tell you us a bit more. And you can actually see one of their scanners here on the bottom right side. And um, these BotSpot scanners are very professional setups with like very controlled lighting. Um, but of course, they're not like uh, um, something that anyone would buy. And there's this other trend that people that have the most recent iPhone can enjoy already the using the object capture technology from Apple to create 3D scans themselves with their phones. And naturally, uh, the results will not be as good as if you like capture things under very controlled conditions. But uh, yeah, depending on the object category and the application, this may also be an option. And uh, then there are services, like we talked about a CG Trader already, and uh, others like Shopify, for example, are uh, starting to, to launch very specific services as well, where you can, for example, like, this kind of a meta service, if you will, like they basically refer you to a 3D company that helps you to get assets done for your online shop, and then they can inject them into their, their Shopify shop. And CGI by Otto is another example where Otto has basically started to offer uh, the CGI processes that they develop in-house also to other companies that are also, let's say, modeling furniture um, for the use in their own catalogs. And um, having content created, yeah, we are coming to the second topic, which is content encoding. And I just talked about CGI. So what you can see here on the left-hand side is actually um, CGI models, right? Uh, like those are not all pictures. Uh, like you can see the, the woman there on the uh, armchair, that's uh, probably a real person. But um, if you look at uh, things like the IKEA catalog, um, more than 75% uh, of what you see there is pure CGI, not a photo, right? So that's actually pretty cool because we know that if we want to create AR experiences uh, of all these products, we have already 3D representations. So can we just, I don't know, take a 3D as Max file and put it into AR? Mm, well, unfortunately, not directly. So these offline models um, use way different representations, way different material systems, and converting one to the other 
even for a single asset is not trivial, but we need to do this on a global scale for millions of assets if we want to enable everyone who has these CGI assets for their catalogs to have the same assets in 3D, in AR, on uh, the displayed in real time on the phones of the clients. So, and GLTF is one example as a target, uh, like an optimized cross-platform delivery format that can be efficiently used on the web and in AR. So how to get there? Um, some more properties, uh, like that we heard about that also during the QA uh, from the CG uh, trader talk here. Um, there are extensions like IRR, specular transmission and volume that mimic different like uh, rendering effects that you that are sometimes even very hard to, to even show in real time, but we can do it uh, with the, and there are even standardized like uh, ways to do it now with these GLTF extensions, which is super exciting. Um, but still, the way these materials are set up is quite different from the way the offline materials are set up. And on the right hand side, you see another useful extension, which is called material variance. And that basically allows you to encode the geometry and UVs of a model once and um, switch out different materials on one model. So shipping one model with more than one material specifically for switching colorways like this one here um, during uh, a real time uh, like display in the browser, for example. So how can I get data into this format if I have offline data? Well, just looking at it from a very high level here, there are basically two areas. One is geometry and one is materials. And for geometry, this is actually the easier challenge. It involves things like tessellating, freeform surfaces, or uh, baking, subdivision surfaces to a certain level. And then, yeah, you have something like a uh, quad mesh or a triangle mesh, and uh, can use that basically to uh, set up your GLTF model, right? So um, basically, you can triangulate quads trivially by just splitting them and then you have in the end a triangle mesh that you can put into GLTF. The more challenging part is usually getting the UVs right. So the UV scaling, uh, for example, because um, if you look at a typical setup with uh, tiling materials and V-Ray or so, then you will uh, have multiple um, parts in the pipeline where you can adjust the UV scale. And uh, basically you have to get this baked into things like texture transforms uh, or like just the, the scaled uh, UV coordinates to display it correctly then with exactly the same uh, tiling size in the real-time version. With that all being solved, the bigger challenge that remains are actually the materials and we've heard quite a lot of approaches are like how people are trying to solve this problem. Converting V-Ray nodes is something we talked about earlier um, and Pavel gave some insights there. So physical material was also mentioned during the Q&A uh, session earlier. So this is uh, definitely one of the, the biggest challenges, converting a random set of V-Ray nodes to something like 3ds Max physical material that approximates the appearance as closely as possible. Um, knowing that the PBR format may be a bit more limited um, and V-Ray nodes can also contain non-PBR properties that are more like artistic expression. And um, this conversion can be uh, done on a node by node basis, basically. Uh, so let's say I have a V-Ray node uh, and I want to translate it into like a physical material. So I walk the whole graph that is connected to it and uh, go over all the slots and figure out or I can maybe bake maps there and so on. But there's also another approach that we can take, which is a, uh, basically a material-based conversion workflow where we use something like a material library or build something like a material library and convert material by material. So saying, hey, this material is called Chrome and then some number, and I know that identifier, and I've seen it across a lot of builds of materials. So why don't I just go into my library and look if I have converted this material before, and then I take this high quality GLTF version that I have of this material uh, that an artist has maybe even created once. And I just swap that in and say, okay, this is now my, my real time material for this part. And I don't have to look at the VRA notes uh, or understand them. But this however requires that you have a solid understanding of your bill of materials um, and um, 
no, can actually tell that this material is actually the one that you have in your library. But this can be a big lever. So material libraries come in super handy at this point. And then finally, the third challenge is content optimization. So um, another problem in this uh, workflow here is that if you have a CGI asset, it's usually quite large. And uh, if you bake it down, like by, uh, by you know, like baking the subdivision surfaces and like tessellating them, it doesn't make it directly better. Uh, like uh, you may end up with a super complex asset with some millions of polygons. And uh, also the materials don't need to be like simple in the first place. That's not the purpose here. Purpose is to have like a high quality photorealistic rendering and an asset may easily consume 500 megabytes or so. And rendering uh, a high quality image of that asset can even take hours. And um, that's accepted, uh, that, that, that's common. Uh, even if it renders in minutes, it's still too slow for real time because there we're talking about you want 60 FPS uh, rendering within less than 17 milliseconds. And if you want to use this asset in a real time application where you basically stream it over the web, then it needs to be loaded in a couple of seconds, which means the file size can't be too large. And rather than 500 megabytes should be maybe five megabyte maximum or so. So this is another problem and again, this needs to be done for millions of assets out there. So what you do there is basically a combination of uh, typical uh, tools that artists would use to crunch this asset down. So reducing polygons, reducing draw calls, baking down the materials, applying compression such as um, the basis compression for the textures or Draco for the geometry. And this is basically what we are focusing on with Rapid Compact as well that we're taking these offline assets, uh, such as like the left-hand side here of this example with this armchair here and um, crunching them down fully automatically to a real-time version, such as the one you can see here on the right. And that also involves usually a format conversion like here from FBX to GLTF or USDC. But as said, this process basically um, is independent of a format. You wanna reduce the poly count to reasonable maximum, uh, minimum, sorry. Um, you, uh, maximum, <laughs> um, maximum uh, visual appearance at minimal polygon count, basically. And um, yeah, basically optimize the asset for the platform that you want to serve. And if uh, there are five or 10 different platforms, then maybe you even have to have five or 10 different optimized versions. And we have done this for a couple of data types. So there are, for example, um, CAD models that uh, require slightly different treatment compared to 3D scanned objects. And um, again, different treatment for objects that come out of common DCC tools. So main takeaways of this presentation, 3D content is really becoming a new media type. And we see a lot of challenges when scaling up these 3D use cases now, because we're basically missing a lot of tools still, uh, um, the ecosystem is not that mature that it's just as easy to use as we would like it to be. So the main challenges are content creation, encoding and optimization. But with all that said, we can see that a lot of solutions are already being implemented and the growing 3D ecosystem already started to solve these challenges uh, now step by step. And that's actually what this whole event today is also about. Uh, scaling up 3D use cases and different approaches to solving each of these challenges in a divide and conquer fashion. So with that said, um, I want to conclude my talk and much looking forward to your questions. I have a question actually. Uh, All right. Since I, yeah, so how do you see the trade-off between transparency and polygons? Because you mentioned, of course, like that you can, with the weaker chair, that you can yeah, limit number of, of polys uh, in favor of, of transparency. I mean, of like, yeah, map with alpha. But this is also like heavy on the GPU, right? So especially for mobile, how do you see this uh, you know, trade off between those two? Yeah, um, I totally agree. Uh, this is, I think for this example, it's done nicely, right? So, so it's, uh, Kind of picking picking good example here, but uh, of course this this is not a perfect way. It's kind of cheating also in various ways. Um, 
go away like there and like using this alpha test if you zoom in at some point if you go really close it will not look good right um you will you will see basically interpolation uh, on the texels and uh, it's it's going to look flat and um so so it's not going to look like real wicker material if you zoom in really closely um however on the other side um it it gives you a representation that is in this case reasonably efficient to render and um this is uh, to be fair i think i really picked an edge case here right because wicker is one of these edge cases where you where you maybe really don't get too far if you want to crunch the, the polygon count down. On the other hand, we see a lot of assets where it actually is okay if you still model these parts as polygons, as long as the resolution is not too high because then your mobile GPU is able to render, let's say, I don't know, easily 150,000 polygon model fluently. And it's, it's really no, no problem, right? If you display it as a single item somewhere. Um, because we're not having a game with like, I don't know, 100 assets on the screen and using different LODs and so. So we, if we just show a single single object, it, I, it could work in many cases as well with geometry. But uh, yeah, I think this this is one of the, um, yeah, the, the most challenging uh, uh, bits and pieces like transparency, or in this case, it's as, actually something like fake fake transparency, right? It's not really seeing through an object, it's more alpha testing, like masking, basically. Masking is, I think, the, the better word, probably, um, instead of alpha testing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question.